So, uh, if the idea is that we're going to be sharing and posting content on a regular basis, if that's our idea, you know, we have to be active. Uh, we might run out of ideas. Uh, we might get fatigue, etc. So, uh, let me let me mention uh, a website that I really like as a way to get ideas and keep up to date with all of this, because. Uh, I forgot to mention it this week, especially if you were new, but last week what I said was that not only do I teach these classes, but I'm also part of a business that, that we do this. We, we make websites for clients, uh, we run their social media, uh, we build e-commerce stores, etc. So uh, whatever we do in these classes, I would be doing for uh, real clients. And to keep up to date with all of this stuff, um, here's one website that I like socialmediaexaminer.com This is one of many websites out there. This is a like a trade journal of social media. Uh, there's many of them of course, but I like this one, Social Media Examiner. Uh, you might get a pop-up. I'm going to close that. I'll put this in the notes of course. Say over here also check out the examiner for more tips and to keep up to date so the thing with people want to be hands-on with all of these networks and it makes sense but uh, whatever might work for one person doesn't exactly work for another person because of their audience or various other factors. So the more you know and the more you practice and try, uh, the more you kind of figure out what's working for you. But these are good starting points here. So uh, let's see what kind of article, yeah. I have two questions. One is um, you're talking about as you get more involved posting more regularly. I know on Facebook and I think now on Instagram you can schedule posts ahead of time. Do mm -hmm. you do that on Google? Plus, without using a plugin? That's one of the things that is lacking. You cannot schedule posts on Google Plus without using a third-party system. Other ones, you can do that. You can do that on Facebook, of course. Instagram lets you do that, but it's tied to Facebook. Um, Twitter lets you schedule, but you have to use TweetDeck. So uh, there are these third-party systems that, that we'll talk about, but uh, scheduling is very useful nowadays because I don't want to be chained to my computer. If I'm going to be sharing something every, every week and I'm going to forget this week, it'd be good to schedule. So yeah, we'll, we'll cover scheduling as well. In, in, a, in a simple way, um, I would say, you know, at certain times of day, you're more creative than others. And if your blog location time slot is a certain hour, when, uh, when you're completely out of it, um, what do you do? You just sort of prepare your blog and then do a cut and paste and then drop in and go ahead and do it that way? Um, most of these networks um, have some sort of way for you to schedule, like, like we're saying here, that if I write this stuff when I do have the creativity or the willpower for it, and then I can then schedule it so that it'll automatically be published when I tell it to. So if that particular day I'm not feeling up to it, I had already scheduled it so that it would appear for me. Okay, so like a cartoon person will have a week's worth of work done on two or three days and then they'll be the whole, the whole mm -hmm. you know, putting the cartridge and shot out of the newspaper on, mm -hmm. on the following day. Yeah, um, depending how advanced we get, um, and this is something that we would do in the in our company, that yeah, we would, we would figure out uh, what sort of, how far ahead could we put stuff out there and schedule it so that it appears um, somewhat automated um, about uh, when, we, when we tell it to appear. So let's see, we've got it here. So we've got here various articles, one on YouTube, They've got this. Um, they've got. They've got this cool video series they've been doing for a few weeks, actually, on this site called The Journey, and this is uh, kind of like a reality TV show, kind of about a business setting themselves up 
and how they're doing it and their, their pitfalls and their triumphs in social media. So uh, this might be kind of a cool little short going to watch. To... It's you know pretty short. It's usually ten minutes long at the at the longest, and it's just like real world stuff happening about what do I need to do in my business to get on social media. So they've got their little reality show thing. Six blogger tools for sharing and promoting new content. Okay, then we've got how to use your YouTube community. Next page. So there's 722 pages full of stuff that they've been publishing for years and years and years. Seven Twitter hashtag research tools for marketers. Last week we talked about Twitter and we talked about hashtags and I kinda gave some general ideas of hashtags but again in most of these classes I have to be pretty general because one person is selling drywall and another person is selling fencing. So one thing for one person doesn't apply to another person. So in general, we can kind of talk about these topics, but in specifics, this is why I lead you to something like Social Media Examiner, because okay, I need to do my research for my own company to use Twitter hashtags the best. If I told everyone, don't forget to use, you know, hashtag San Diego, well, that doesn't apply because I sell my product all over the US. So I can't always really be specific in how to do social media in every aspect, but I can say enough in general, and then I can hopefully guide us to something that'll be more useful to people individually. Yes? You're the third person that has recommended this website, mm -hmm. and it is very informative, but it is also, as you showed, 722 pages. Are there any suggestions on how to get started in just navigating through this website? Yep, yeah, it depends on how many wine bottles you have at home, and then uh, <laughs> open up a few and then get by the fireplace and read them on your tablet. No, uh, you've got here search. Again, search is always very important, even on a site like this. Uh, there's so much that I can look at here, and I wish they would kind of like curate it a little bit more by like beginners. And I go to that screen and it's got all the beginner stuff. And then advanced, and I go to advanced. The closest that they have is you can search categories here. So if you're interested, like, you know, Google Plus, and okay, I'm starting to type something and I get all these pop-ups. Okay, Google Analytics for Facebook, Google Plus Hangout Audience, uh, Google Reshapes Google Plus. So I have these different things, like what's a, what's a community? We'll talk about that in a bit. But here then I get, I get results based on that particular topic. So I would basically do it, use their search, and, and look for topics that you, that you think you're interested in, and as you read an article, often an article also suggests read this one and read that one. So I wish they would kind of curate it a little bit more into topics that we can jump into, but search is very helpful. Yes? They do have something called Starting that has... Where do you find that at? Up along the top there, just for, it's like, it's like it's <clears throat> oh, okay. Usually I go directly to the articles, but let's see here. Getting started with social media, resource guide, our original research, our shows, so that they are talking about their their videos. They've got a podcast, so an audio show. So uh, this one's interesting. Yeah, this, this could be useful. I hadn't quite noticed it, I guess, but yeah, we've got that starting point starting there. That might be a good way. Now that's also several pages long to look at, but it's, it's a place to start off. Pinterest, Snapchat, live video. Eighteen apps and tools for social media marketers. Well, I can barely handle one, and here's eighteen of them. So yes, this is um, this is why a social media marketer is a viable profession nowadays. I'm busy running my business. I'm going to hire someone to do it. Hopefully, out of the out of the course of this course, uh, you get the knowledge that you need to get your foot in the door and, and, and try it and, and do it and see how it helpful it is. I see people all the time that come to these classes and then come to me a semester or two later and tell me, you know, your class did help it. It got me, I'm not afraid of the, I'm not afraid of Twitter anymore or I'm really starting to use Facebook boostings and such. Uh, so um, you you have the ability to do these things it's just that yes there are a lot of things to wrap your head around I think social media can be complicated but not difficult and I believe things can have complication but not be difficult you know building a house is complicated and difficult but 
running social media. I don't think it's difficult. I think there's a lot to do and a lot to learn, but I think it's doable. It just takes time and effort and practice and success and failure. But I think it's doable. It's not that hard. It's just a lot to get, get into your mind. So I'll be sharing other websites as time goes on, but uh, I would recommend uh, browsing Social Media Examiner. And you know we didn't, uh, we don't have time to cover every single network in detail. You know I could do, uh, you know, four weeks on one network, but I want to cover um, different networks uh, in general to kind of see it from different perspectives. And you're able to go in and get even more knowledge in a site like this or others. So. Um, let me see here. Cross posting. We'll get back to that. We started to answer about identifying. Uh, so the purpose of okay. Then we talked about uh, you should set up your account properly before trying to get followers. We'll talk about a few more followers. Again, on, on these, I'm not specifying any of this. This is how you get followers on Facebook. This is how you get followers on Google Plus. All of these apply to various topics or to various networks in different ways, perhaps. We talked about following an account that you've identified, interacting with an account. And this was kind of uh, getting alluded to a little bit earlier, so now, so now I'll get to it here. I call this sniping followers. Sniping or stealing, although that's not the right word for it. Most networks are very public, especially for businesses. So you're able to who uh, you're able to see who who your competition is following or who their followers are. So if I identify another bakery, and it doesn't have to be in the same city, or state, or country, uh, if I identify another bakery, I can go look who is following them, and who are they following. On all the networks, I can do this, on Twitter, on Facebook, etc. I can see who my competition is following. So. If, if they have already done some of the hard work of identifying these people here are interested in baked goods, I can go then also try to interact or follow those accounts. Let's see if I can show an example here. Uh, Gloria, she's, it says she's got 3,000 followers. So um, it depends on each network. Um, let's see here. So on this particular network, Google Plus, if I click on a person's profile and then click on her um, name, I get more of the information over here also. Uh, they, they haven't shared their email and such. I can see their posts, their photos. This is who they've connected with here. Those so, are followers. what's that? Those are their followers. In this particular case, for them, this is who they are following. Oh. So their connections, yeah. So on this, okay, then I go over here and see this person, and I see their connections, and then I follow connections and connections. Um, I can also see on on her posts, uh, Bonnie Wiltsey, and Jack Batchelor. So I can see on their actual <coughs> posts the people again. That that person, uh, Juan Rodriguez here, right there. So I can see. Because most of this stuff is public, especially for a business, I can see who are they following, who are their followers. I can I can see that this person seems to be pretty popular, 3,000 followers. So I can see there's Juan, there's Bill, there's Bonnie, etc. So I have that ability. Yes? So now that person who's 
followers you're looking into, are they aware that you're checking their followers? Nope. Okay. This is anonymous. And I can. You, like you just clicked on one of their followers, mm -hmm. which that person's not going to know that you clicked on their mind. No, the only way people will know that I'm doing reconnaissance is when I click a follow, when I click a like, when I reply, but simply looking at their stuff that is no alert. Okay. So this is this is this tactic here, sniping. Uh, so most of these are open. So uh, take advantage of this. See who they are following, interacting with. They are not alerted of it. Only when you interact, meaning like, reply, follow, etc. No. Uh, when you follow an account, um, they will get notified, of course, but not with an unfollow. Um, so. Um, there's no problem with that. Question? Yeah. I thought the question should have that if you uh, check someone's profile or uh, page, would they know? On Facebook, sometimes I've seen that the post comes says, Would you like to see if you check your page and see your post? Mm -hmm. Is that true? Um, Even though they haven't uh, liked you or commented. Facebook is often a gray area because Facebook is also a platform in which people can create apps. So that might be an app from a different company unrelated to Facebook that claims to have a service that says, use our app to identify who has seen your site, your account, which it may work, it may not. But oftentimes, you have to approve that app to activate itself on your account. Meaning, then you're going to give them access to your contacts and your address book and your posts and all of that. So, to my knowledge, and it might have been changed, it might have changed because these networks change. To my knowledge, I don't think Facebook officially gives you a way to see who has seen your 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 site, your your profile, unless you're a business. Um, and so, if you've got you know one of these third-party apps, those might tell you, but I wouldn't trust those. Because, you know, two billion people, someone's greedy enough to make this app that's going to steal your info. So I wouldn't trust any of those third-party apps except what, what Facebook has uh, officially. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so uh, this tactic right here, this one obviously takes a little bit of work. Um, one way to get the ball rolling, again, is via search. So uh, we'll put it in its own separate way over here, which we covered with Twitter. You search to find topics, you know, keywords about your business, to find the people that matter to your business. <clears throat> so in search, on all the networks, you have some sort of search button. Let's say I'm going to look for... Um, birthday cakes. I might get some pop-ups that happen here. I would ignore those. I just search a topic. Google Plus, one of its nuances that's different from the other networks is it shows you results in, in different ways because of what it has um, as, as its differences from other networks. What I mean, Google Plus here says, here are results for birthday cakes in communities, people, collections, and actual posts. Other social networks don't have some of these things. Other social networks don't have a community or a collection. But if I, let's say I ignore those at the moment, it will of course show me what people are actually, what people or companies are sharing. This one says that one day ago, Fondant Follies Cakes shared this 20 hours ago. The Point of Ridgeland shared that. Chef Agatha one day ago, 
etc. So even if I don't see like individual people right away, the point of this, you know, if I just see a bunch of company results, that's still valuable. Because let's say all of these are companies. Uh, Gatsy Cakes. Okay, here's a company that's trying to sell a cake. Maybe the cake is cool, but the picture's terrible. So I could go over to that particular account. They've only got one follower, so that's not that useful. But let's say they had other connections and other links. I could go further see them. So as I search, and I identify these accounts, I can, I can go further in and see their connections. Unique and powerful feature of Google Plus communities. So, as I said in the beginning, um, we have no followers. So, I'm posting stuff on Google Plus, no one sees it. But the point of posting to no one is that I create content that then hopefully people will will then see this is good let me let me follow let me follow them well one thing that google plus has that i really like compared to the other networks is something called communities so communities are places where people congregate on a topic people interested in a certain topic are all in this location in Google Plus talking and sharing about this topic. It's kind of like a chat room. It's not, it's not live in that you know people type something, you see it right away like a classic chat room. It is a place where people congregate together. Yes? Is that like blogging, the same thing? What's the difference between blogging and, and the, you know? Blogging is more that you yourself are writing articles for people to read. Then a community is that everyone is sort of chatting together on a certain topic. Let me show one here. Yes. Is that different from what? What is a hangout? There's a hangout button. There's a click on people's. Hangout is kind of like Skype. You know, with Skype you talk with someone one on one, or I think on Hangouts you can talk to like ten people at once. Is there like a private message? It's like a no, private message. It's not publicly posted. No. Hangouts are for individual people, kind of like one-on-one, one-on-one -on -one chat, uh, Skyping. Yeah. Yeah. It depends on how they've got it set up, but but yeah, if you if you see that, yeah, if you see that it says Hangout, start a Hangout. That means like you know, chat with that one person individually. You can have like uh, I think up to ten people. Uh, but yeah. Is it live or is it yeah. like sending a text message? So well, the text I, message is live. The, I'm in the Hangout. The other person might be on the other part of the planet. I click the Hangout and say, hey, you know what? I'm looking at travel in there. You know, can you give me some input on that location? And then I go about my day. They, they get to it when they get to it, or do we have to both be online at the same time? Well, that, that, that's the same as chatting, because if I am chatting with someone in England, Time zones are different, so they might not answer me until the morning. So yeah, it's live in the sense that if both of you are on at the same time, it'll be instantaneous. But if there's different time zones, they'll reply when they can. Uh, and so, um, so let's say an example here. Um, let me just search for basically baking. I get results of baking. Okay, so communities, people, etc. I've got this community, baking community, 113,000 members. Cakes and baking, 990,000 members. Cooking and baking, 600,000. Okay, these say join. I'll get back to join in a moment. But let's say 
if you search on any community, you get results. You click on the little icon, not join, but you click on it. You actually get a little preview about what's, what's inside. You see that there's 113,000 people, and you see different people. Shirley, Dragana, Alida, Baby, Rock My Day, Street Food Lover. Okay, you get all these people, businesses, posting. 113,000 people. So, uh, as an example, after joining a community, you then have a spot to then contribute. So, right now I have zero followers. But if I join a community, I now have an audience of 113,000. 113,000 interested on this topic of baking and cookies and such. So, any of these communities, that I um, that I join is a captive audience it's su it's almost like suddenly I have this many followers so great I'm gonna join this one over here that's got 900,000 uh, communities are very powerful I really like them I really recommend them for people on Google Plus no other network has anything exactly like this and I personally from dealing with clients I've seen a lot of great results in people using communities. There are some uh, there are some downsides though, which of course I'll talk about here. But on my notes, these are great to start to build your followers. You can join a community and start posting there, reaching a captive audience. You suddenly get a lot of followers. They're not exactly followers. They're not really following your account. But a person that has chosen to join a community is sort of like following all of the people in that community. So your stuff will show up there. Well, downsides of that some communities some communities are exclusive you have to ask to join some communities will have a button that says ask to join so someone is going to approve you or not and if you've got an account with nothing on it, why would they approve you? They see that you're, you're nothing to, to contribute. You don't have anything that will contribute to our community, so you don't get, you don't get approved. If I've got those five posts that I'm, that I'm telling you about, if you've got already content that you're creating before trying to join communities or get followers, that's going to help you. That's going to show the moderator that, OK, uh, this person seems interesting. They're going to be on topic. We'll let them join. They can come in to our 900,000 member community. I said moderator. Downside is communities are often moderated. So someone or a group of people are the moderators. They are the law in that community. They decide who can join it, who cannot, who can be kicked out, who can be muted, who can be deleted. These moderators are regular people. Mods are regular people, not Google employees. Uh, a group of people decided to join together and, and create a community about San Diego businesses. So. They have it set up, ask to join. I click ask to join. My account is not set up yet, so they reject me. OK, I try again. I set up my account. I put my biography. I am in San Diego. I put some photos of San Diego. I'm in San Diego. I click it. They approve me. I then post a message that says, hey, everyone, I'm having a sale this Saturday. Main Street, come on over. Coupon. Then they boot me from the community. Because moderators set the rules of the community, the downside. They often have rules that are enforced. So if a community has chosen to say, you may only post one thing per day, 
and you posted two things, and the moderator is especially dictatorial, you might get kicked out. Your post might get deleted. You might get muted. There's various actions that a moderator can do. Well, who are these people? Again, these are regular people. These are not people employed by Google to keep everything on track. Anyone can create a community. You have the option in Google Plus to create a community. I don't recommend you do so, and I'll tell you why later. But these communities are often created by people that are passionate about a topic, and they often want to keep it on topic. So they're not going to let spammers in. And if you get identified as a spammer, you might get kicked out. The rules of the community vary by community. I'm looking at the cakes community. On the left side, before I join, keep calm and bake on. Share recipes and get sweet inspiration. OK, great. About the community, share and discover the most delicious recipes imaginable. Please note that this is no longer actively managed. OK, so in this particular community, anything goes. And the problem with that is anything goes, so I'm sure there's going to be junk here that doesn't matter. You know, the secret drink eliminates body fat. Okay, fake. And um, see any other junk? Um, you know, stuff that doesn't relate to baking is going to show up here because the moderators, it, sometimes that happens, the community gets so big it's hard for someone to moderate it. Let me see if I see another example. The baking community. For anyone who loves to bake. A community for everyone who enjoys the sweeter side of life. Come connect. So some communities spell out like a paragraph full of rules that say what you can and cannot do in the community. Others are more open. About the community. Community rules. Be active. Plus one or like and comment. Ask questions. Share. The more you do, the greater the community will be. Add the description to your post. Don't just drop a link. Post should include a link. No blurry images. Please stick to food-related topics. No nudity or offensive language. No more than three shares per day. The language of the community is English. Happy cooking and baking. So if you don't agree with any of those, I post something in Spanish. Worst case scenario, they, they, someone, one of the moderators gently tells me, please remember to post in English. OK, next level up. Some moderator might say, uh, you broke the rules. Please remove your post. What could happen then is they remove my post. The worst thing, I get removed. So then I lost access to 117,000 potential followers, potential customers. So they often have rules that are enforced. Read the rules. Follow the rules. You may be removed and then lose access to the people. As I said, anecdotally, for clients that we've worked with, we often, in one of our social media packages, uh, that they hire us for, we we get hired to, to run and set up their Facebook, their Twitter, and then a third choice. We would recommend often Google+. Uh, and with those three networks, depending on their level of effort that they want us to do, meaning the, meaning the money that they're paying us, we often get good results uh, in Google+, communities, because the right people are already congregating in the right place for the right topic. Over on Twitter, I have to do research on the right hashtag or researching the right keyword. And that takes a while, and it's getting me to a dead end. I can't find the people. I'm having trouble building followers on Twitter. On Facebook, as we'll see later, well, I'm having trouble there. Um, you know, I'm a needle in a haystack. There's 2 billion people there. I'm having a hard time standing out. I often find that for, for many kinds of clients, getting into the right community on Google Plus gets you results right away, from likes to replies to follows to buys. And it doesn't happen overnight. Uh, even if you're spending a lot of time and effort, every day you're posting something. You might not get that first sale until a month later. Or it may be that you share something once a week, and then you get a sale a month later. Uh, every business is different. 
everyone has different luck or different competition, different results. But I really see a lot of good results on communities if you follow the rules of the communities and you stay on topic and you know you follow the rules. That's a big one. Yeah. Okay, versus collections. A collection is where only you post for people to see. A community is where many people can post to see content. So if I create a collection called uh, cookies, only I can put pictures and videos and text into that collection. Other people can see it and reply and comment and like and follow, but no one else can contribute to my cookies collection. Only I have access to it. If I follow a community, if I create a community called cookies, I can post whatever I want there and I can invite people and people can join and they can post stuff about cookies. So community is communal and the collection is only my own stuff. Do you do both? Do I do both? Um, I would not recommend less valuable collection. If I've got if I've got limited time, I got to run a business. I would not do both. I would focus on communities. Um, more people are already there, so I'll just go where the people are. Yes. Well, I was going to do a little bit of a follow-up question: Is when you post to a community, is there a way to automatically add it to a collection? So, like, is a collection something that's on my site that if I'm doing all San Diego sunsets, hmm. I'm posting it in a landscape photography community and add it to my San Diego sunsets collection? You know, so no. It's two separate things. I'd have to post it. You'd have to post it twice. Uh, to my knowledge, at the moment, maybe after this big change that's coming, I don't know. But at the moment, if you put something into a community, it can only be put into the community, not also into a collection. What you could do is post that photo to the community and also post, make a new post to put it into your collection. They're not linked together, so whatever traffic you might have been getting from the community post does not come to your collection. If, if I could follow up, hmm? are the collections more valuable as your follower base appears? In other words, if That's I a good question. If I have a following base of a couple hundred thousand people, and I've got collections, is that going to help rank me in the That's something that I need to educate myself on a little bit more to get that answer, because usually what I've done for myself or clients, we focused a lot on communities, which has given them the followers and yeah. such. I could see logically the value then about then also using collections to build the audience even more. It's just that in one sense of it, it's double the work because I was doing the work to build a community via communities. I was building, I was doing the work to build followers via communities. Then now I've also got to do collections, so it's kind of double work, which may pay off. But usually for clients, we focused on one because there's just so much time and budget to go around. Oh, I'm, mm -hmm. um, I'm posting to community. I, I absolutely mm -hmm. I think that's a place to start. If somebody wants to check out my image or my stuff, mm -hmm. um, if I've got collections there, then so they can see more of what I've posted. So is that a way to build that initial content? Then, so a couple collections, yeah. a bunch of photos in each one, and then start joining communities. That would make sense too, so I'll, I'll go ahead and add it here because it, it is something here. Uh, before trying to get followers, set up the account, start up with at least five different things. Specifically for Google+, you know, th all of these notes that I set up here apply to all the networks. There's no collections in Twitter, so it wouldn't apply there, but then I'll mention it here. For Google+, also maybe create at least one collection. So to have even more value, to entice people, what else am I about? Um, follow me. Yes. I have I've heard of this term collection before. I mean, communities is pretty rare, but uh, is that a link within Google Plus or other networks? It's definitely in Google Plus, and other networks may have a variation of it. In Pinterest, you can kind of think of a collection as a board. So if you use Pinterest to organize your pins into boards, that's a collection in Google+. 
So a collection is just grouped content on a certain topic. Twitter doesn't have that. The closest thing is sort of a hashtag. If you hashtag all your posts of a certain topic, they're kind of grouped together in a hashtag. So here, Google+, Plus, it's a group of certain things, a group of certain videos, certain text, etc. Pinterest, all of the certain idea or certain content is grouped in a board, pin board on Pinterest. Sort of uh, in Instagram, sort of a story is sort of a collection. So they've all got their versions with their own names and nuances. But on, the, on Google Plus here, where it has the word communities, can you also look up the word collections and find collections in there? Yeah, when you do the search here, um, it, it shows results right here. These are communities on that topic and people and collections. Oh, okay. So it does show, it does show results. Thank you. So um, there is value to collections, although if we're limited on our time and budget and effort and such, I would stick with communities. I would definitely follow the rules of the communities. Uh, post in there, you get this big audience right away. Very good. Um, I, I did say a little bit ago about um, you can create your own community. I'm going to say here, uh, do not create your own communities. Well, I want to create the Small Business San Diego community. Great, you can do so. But there's so many communities in the graveyard of communities that fall by the wayside. For example, cookies. As I scroll over, the numbers are decreasing and decreasing and decreasing. All of these other people had a great idea. Kawaii Sweet World, 20 members, ask to join. Fan of Cookie, 130. So at a certain point, so Cookie Jars Bakery, so some little business made their own community. They've got 24 members. I bet nothing has been added there in years. Two days ago, 12 hours ago, two days ago. Well, okay. But are you going to build, are you going to have a viable community with, are you going to have viable sales and such out of only, you know, 24, 24 members or so? When you're on a higher, when you're in communities with more people, there's that 1% again. Even though I've got 113,000 possible viewers in another community still 1% of that it's only 1% so joining this 1% of 24 is like what 0 0.2 half of a person a quarter of a person so the problem with you creating your own communities is that then you have to become the moderator keep things on track keep the spam at bay keep the topic on track approve people whatever I don't have time for that. I'm running my business. So I don't recommend you create communities because it's just too much work. If you've got the time, if you're retired, okay, great. But then you're going to have to spend the time to then build that community, keep it on track, advertise it, promote it, get more followers, more, 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 more people to join. So there's lots of communities. Of course, I would join the communities that would make sense. You know, this one's got 429,000. But my business is not at all about developing Android apps. So even if they do, even if it's just a plain old join, or even if they somehow approve me, I'm going to be posting on a community that does not make sense where I'm posting, which then people will either ignore, best case scenario, or I might get kicked out of the community. And then I lose those viewers. Yes? Is there a benefit to creating a community? Like if you reach a certain number of um, followers, followers, you do you get, start getting paid for it? Or no, at the moment, uh, you don't get any, any monetary benefits out of using most social networks, the, the catch. The, the, the one of them is YouTube. You do get money from YouTube, but that's changing. Most of these networks, you, you don't really make money directly off of the network, so no, there's no perks for you suddenly getting 10,000 or 100 or whatever. 
the, the big perk of it would be that I've got a captive audience. But I think it's way too much of an uphill battle to try to build a community. Just instead, join communities, get followers to your main profile, and then just take advantage of communities that already exist. Do not create your own communities. It's too much hassle. I think it was asked last week, and I was also asked again this question from, from a lot earlier, cross-posting. So let's talk a little bit about that, then we'll be toward the end of the day. Um, okay, so cross-posting is posting the same thing across different networks. So I had the answer yes. But and I'll explain it this way. Beginner, intermediate, advanced. The same photo and text to all networks. Intermediate. The same photo, but different text to each network. Advanced. A different photo and different text to each network. OK, so let's say you take the class and you're convinced. OK, I've got to be on Twitter and Snapchat and Facebook. Let's say I decide that after taking the class. So then, okay, well, it takes a lot of work. So I'm going to take a very cool photo of my product, and I'm going to share it on Twitter, Snapchat, and Facebook the exact same way to all three networks. Um, the benefit of doing that is that you're, you've, you've shared content to all of those networks to then potentially build your followers. The problem with that, then we get intermediate and advanced. The problem with that is, OK, let's say I, I'm, I'm getting pretty good amount of followers on Twitter. Once in a while on Twitter, I'm going to mention, don't forget to follow us on Snapchat. Well, someone's going to go to your Snapchat and see the exact same thing on Snapchat and the exact same thing on Facebook. So why would I follow you on those other networks if I'm going to see the exact same thing on the first network? If you vary it up a little bit, intermediate or advanced, there's something different for people to see on the different networks. Uh, so people see that all the time, that I'm doing really well on Facebook, but I'm not getting then more followers. And I've asked all my followers on Facebook to follow me on LinkedIn. That's where I'm making my money, and no one's following me. Maybe because you've got the same content on all networks. Or maybe the content of the network I mean, the character of the network is different from, from the other, net, other networks. Uh, LinkedIn is often touted as the professional social network. So on LinkedIn, I'm not going to share funny cat pictures and stuff. I'm going to share photos or content of professional aspects. Maybe I am a pet shop, so maybe the funny cat picture will make sense. But if I'm sharing something fun and friendly for family on Facebook, I probably don't want to share the same thing on my other network that is more about um, professionalism. Let's say I'm very outgoing and uh, you know very sportsy or whatever, and I'm sharing that stuff on just to pick one Instagram, and I've got a big audience of out of, of outdoors people, people that like you know nature and the outdoors, and then I try to share that on another network like a, like Twitter, where my follower base there is not quite outdoorsy, they're more indoorsy, so my network is different. My people are different, my followers are different, and having the exact same thing on every network might not help me. These other levels, of course, are more work, more difficult, more effort. 
So if I'm going to do something on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, the advanced level that I've got here, you need to have a different picture and a different text for each one. So three different pictures on each network, or three different little text blurbs, or something different on each network. Yeah, a lot of effort. It's perfectly fine, and I recommend for most people to do intermediate. You have a great photo that shows off your product, but describe it a little different on each network. Try to think of a different adjective for each network. Or maybe share the same photo on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, but on Twitter put it on Monday, and on Facebook on Wednesday, and on Instagram on Friday. So you have different things, different days, um, some variation, some enticement for people to follow you on the different networks. So cross-posting, you can do it, and I'll even show you a tool in just a moment, where you can do it for all the networks, but the problem is that it's the exact same thing on all the networks. So beginner, intermediate, and advanced. Reason why would people follow you on a different network if you have the same thing on each network? Yes. So if you're going to vary the content and um, um, you're going to post something onto Google Plus, you said earlier about each social network having its own style and demographic. How would you characterize the style and demographic of Google Plus? These things are always changing, and, and I hesitate to give like a full answer to that early on. But in general, what seems to be the demographic of Google Plus had always been sort of like techie people, technology liking people, because um, Google itself is a company that is very like tech minded and tech savvy. Oftentimes, people that have an Android device want one because it's so customizable compared to an iPhone. So they like the Google products, and Google Plus is a lot more like kind of tech savvy. Now the problem about me saying I hesitate to say early on the demographics is because oftentimes you can find the right audience on just about every network. It may be a little bit more effort to find the right audience on the wrong network, but there's no wrong network if you find the right audience. Oftentimes people say demographics, Pinterest, it's often uh, a great network to find a female audience. So if I'm trying to find uh, women uh, for my product that focuses on women, Pinterest is often a good starting point, but that doesn't mean I'm not going to find my audience of women on Instagram or LinkedIn or Google+. Plus. So um, demographics don't quite matter just yet because you would be able to find your audience. And you can read a lot of great think pieces on places like Social Media Examiner that will kind of give you more data on that too. Uh, one more thing here, one tool, one of many tools that lets you cross post easier and schedule posts, buffer.com. We'll look at this together in just a moment. But let's say in the beginning, I do want to post the same thing on all the networks just to put content, just to get my feet wet, just to get used to these networks. Um, I, I want to use something like possibly like buffer.com. This, an, this is an account that you create that then you link all your social networks into it, and then you can manage all your social networks at once. Which you saw that that's a, one, of the, oops, one of the possible... Uh, downsides or a beginner level. Buffer.com. Save time managing your social media. Buffer is a simple and easier way to schedule posts, track the performance of your content, and manage all your accounts in one place. Most of these online third-party networks are going to have a free version and then a not free version. But let's see if we can find prices over here. So this shows you know, set up, connect all your networks in one place, and then in one place, I'm going to create a brand new thing. Um, I'm going to create a brand new post with a brand new coupon, whatever, and it's automatically going to go to Twitter and Facebook and Instagram. Or this week, I'm going to put it on Twitter, but not on Pinterest. 
So Buffer lets you then send out your, your content to, to the different networks. Um, yes? How long have you, has this Buffer one been available and how long do you think it's going to be available free? It, it feels like it's been around for at least 10 years. I'm pretty sure they're always going to have the free version. And the free version is going to work very well. But then the paid versions are going to be better. And a lot of times, that's how it is on many of these kinds of sites. You get a free version that works very well, and it'll free, be free always. But then you need a little bit extra feature, a little bit extra ability, and that's when the pain comes in. Is it typically in the analytics that you get access to in the paid version? Exactly. The analytics, the data that shows you how well you're doing hour by hour and such, that's oftentimes where the extra pay comes in, and tech support. You know, how does this work? I'm having trouble with that. Help me set this up. I'm having, it's not reading my data. So oftentimes with the paid version, you get more data to make your decisions and tech support. Now, do programs like this review have a recommendation? Is there any way to track where followers come from? When yeah. I was look, when I was looking at it, I see a law firm that's reposting and following people who are yeah. giving credit to the original poster. If I'm getting a bunch of followers from somebody like that, I don't think you know what I mean? Sometimes, um, sometimes the networks are not, not as good as they could be about giving that attribution about where did you get those followers and such. Um, like Pinterest does a very good job of always kind of like telling you exactly where content came from. It's a slightly newer network than the others, so they've integrated that into their system. Other networks, you can't quite tell where did I get this follower from, where did they come from. But once we look at our analytics screens, it will, they're getting a lot better at telling us this attribution. Where did, where did we get this traffic from? And in the real world, yes, it does help to give thanks to your customers and all of that. It also helps in the digital world because it shows you a real company, a real person, not just nameless corporation. So the customer, you know, the, the customer service aspect is always important. Here's the prices. Starter, individual, free. You get three social accounts. So you can connect um, up to three of one. I think that's what that means. You have the possibility of connecting to these networks. Uh, three of them. You can schedule ten posts. So let's say, okay, three. Well, that'll be my Facebook, LinkedIn, and Instagram. I can't do... Twitter for free. The awesome plan is 10, so I can do all of these five, and two of Twitter, and two of Pinterest, and three, whatever. I can schedule 100 posts. Yeah. Is Google not an option up there? Yeah, right there, or Google+. Google+. They're just not all listed up there, right? Not all the networks are Google+. Up. Plus. Oh, okay. Uh, that one looks very similar to Pinterest, but it's Google Plus and Pinterest. Well, I see Pinterest doesn't appear until the awesome level. Look at that. <laughs> so you get Instagram, but not Pinterest. You have to go to that next level. You can't get pictures on the free section. <laughs> looks like it. Yeah. And then higher levels up here, so $99. Monthly price now, if you didn't notice, these are monthly prices. So yes, these can be very expensive. Very expensive. $400 a month. Well, that assumes you're a big company like McDonald's or Nike, and they can afford to have such a big price tag like this. Yeah. But this is going to allow me to sit down and to schedule that next post. The networks, to various degrees, automatically have a built-in scheduling system. This one is an aggregating one to manage them all at once. I'd still have to log in and schedule it in Twitter and schedule it in Facebook and schedule it X, Y, Z. Mm -hmm. Even for the free one, only three networks, that's good enough. I have enough to do three networks, I can manage that. When you get to these other networks with more price, then yeah, you get more features. No, you don't. No, you do it here. Even with the free one, you log into Buffer, 
you connect your three accounts, and then in Buffer, I set up my post, and Buffer will automatically send them to the three accounts. I misunderstood. So I, so I could sit down once a week to do all my social media posts in one spot as opposed to going to a platform. Device. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I was just saying, maybe the confusion was you can do a version of that in the network itself. Or you can aggregate it all in this one control panel. But the limitation is I can only do it to three on the free version. Other things that it doesn't have, look, in this most basic one, it doesn't have very much social analytics or none at all or whatever, advanced analytics. So that doesn't come out until the small business one. Small business one starts at 99 a month. So, you know, that is a big jump there. The networks themselves will give you various bits of, of uh, social analytics, but it's kind of nice to have all of this in one place, but it does get more expensive as time goes, as you need more features. I'll mention other examples of this service, other competitors as time goes on, but uh, I already put it in the notes there. And um, we're getting down to the last minutes of the class. So today we touched on Google Plus again next time. I did confirm in the office we're going to have Monday, uh, we're going to have Friday, Saturday, and Monday a day off. So if you take classes uh, on the on the calendar, if you look here, next week, on the 16th, we have no class. It's part of the President's Day weekend. If you have a Saturday class, no class. We never do Sunday classes. And no class Monday. So the, the 16th and the 19th are a little vacation. So if you come next week on the 16th, uh, I'll be at the beach. Uh, so we'll be back on the 23rd. On the 23rd will be Facebook. Again, we didn't cover every single aspect or every single screen of Google+, Plus. that's OK. In general, we're covering all of these networks. We're getting a feel for them, pros and cons. And then uh, as you look at these different networks, you decide what's valuable for my business, my brand, etc. And we're going to see, again, other perspectives of how do I get followers? How do I get posts? How do I make posts? We see it in different ways, and you apply it on the different networks. General questions? Yes? Yes, normally what I would have done, okay, Twitter, Google+, Facebook, Pinterest. We've got one day missing, so I'm going to push Facebook to the next week and then Pinterest to the week after that. So day one of month two would have been LinkedIn. Well, that's going to be pushed to day two because we've got Pinterest day one on the 9th of March uh, next month. Yeah. So I'm just pushing everything one day forward, and that shouldn't that shouldn't affect things too much. Yeah. Do you have to re-register for the second group? Yes, for part uh, two next month and part three, it's a re-registration process that we'll just do very quickly at the beginning of the day. So uh, thank you for coming. If you have people that are interested in social media, have them come next time. I'm glad to take them. As long as I've got an empty space for people, people can come in. I'll catch them up, give them the syllabus. Remember, these videos are being recorded. If you want to replay anything that I've talked about today, send me an email requesting the video, and I'll send you the link.